Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you, Dad. Um, so let's just jump right in. Um, so we all know that chestnut blight is caused by a fungal pathogen called Cryphonectria parasitica. And I wanted to share a couple of things with you guys that you may not have known about chestnut blight. And that is that its main host obviously is, you know, the species that are in the genus of Castania, which would be chinkapins and chestnuts, but also um, chestnut blight can actually kill an oak as well. So as long as there is host around for the blight to live on, it's going to continue to be a permanent part of our native ecosystem. So the blight is here to stay. There's nothing that we can do about that. So that's why what we're doing is so important because we're actually utilizing the host resistance of the trees. So how does the blight actually kill an Ozark chinkapin? So, um, hey, Tori, really quick before I carry on here, how do I hide the view of you? Um, um, Colleen, hang on, I think I can do this. Sorry, guys. I can't see my own PowerPoint. Okay. All right. Can you guys still hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. All right, so how does the blight actually kill an Ozark chinkapin? So the way that the blight kills a chinkapin is that it has, it's a fungus, obviously, and that fungus produces an acid, and that acid actually kills the tissue. The chestnut blight lives on the dead matter of its host. So what it does is it's a canker disease. It causes these cankers, and here in these photos, you can see that I was lucky enough to find a tree out in the wild that had an initial infection going. So you can see like maybe an insect or something, you know, causes a small abrasion on the tree, whatever it might be, a deer can rub the tree and the fungus enters through that little wound and it'll start to colonize under the bark and it'll start to form a canker and those cankers will coalesce until they wrap completely around the stem. And once they do that, they completely girdle the stem or choke it out. And so in the second photo, you can see uh, what that later stage of infection looks like. And so it basically chokes out the circulation from bringing, um, from the tree bringing the nutrients from the roots up to the tree. So what is the response to infection? So what the trees do as a response to infection is they send up these root collar sprouts. And the tree's root system is actually still alive underground. It's the same original root system, but it'll send up those new shoots. And we actually see this with a lot of different species, not just, you know, chestnuts and chinkapins. A lot of other species do this. Um, and um, it's just a, a survival mechanism. And so what ends up happening is that those new shoots end up getting infected. And it creates this cycle of re-sprouting and eventual dieback. And what that does is it causes these trees that are beautiful trees to have this really unattractive, shrubby kind of appearance. You know, um, dad has talked to me about this a lot, but a lot of people, you know, they don't realize that the Ozark chinkapin is a tree. You know, some people, they'll see the trees presenting with infection and they'll think, oh, that's just a bush. Well, it's not a bush. That's what a susceptible phenotype looks like. It's going to look shrubby. It's going to look multi-stemmed like that. Now, sometimes chinkapin will have more than one um, stem or want more than one trunk and that's just a genetic thing it's just whatever but um, when they look like this clearly this is um, a sign of infection and the real detriment that this has on the trees the chestnut blight is that it actually prevents the trees from becoming old enough to produce male and female flowers so it prevents them from being able to you know sexually reproduce and continue to co-evolve so um, resistant trees exist but you know, sometimes they're not in close enough proximity to actually um, breed with each other. So there, there needs to be intervention there. And you might be wondering, well, how is it possible that a tree could have resistance? My dad, he showed a slide on his presentation um, that was a slide that I had made for my earlier presentation that was talking about the type of resistance that's present in any type of chestnut or chinkapin. And there's two different types of resistance that a plant can have, a host resistance. And that's qualitative resistance, which is, you know, like a single gene or a major gene resistance. And then there's quantitative resistance, which is 
the action of multiple genes contributing to the overall resistance of the tree. And with Ozark chinkapin, that is the type of resistance that we have, thankfully. It is the quantitative resistance. And the first clue that we had that this was the type of resistance that is present is the variation in phenotypes that you have. So in this little graph here, you can see that when it's qualitative or it's major gene resistance, there's two phenotypes. It's either healthy or it's susceptible. So the tree is either completely resistant or it's completely susceptible. And the thing with qualitative resistance is that it's not durable. So if you have a healthy tree um, and you know that genotype crosses with another one, that resistance can be gone in one generation. But with quantitative resistance, the resistance is actually durable and it's partially dominant, so it's additive, okay? So let's move on. So just a quick overview of our breeding program. What do we want? We want genetically diverse populations enriched for resistance. And we want restoration seed produced from a large pool of resistant parent trees. And that is actually what we've been able to do. We talk about this all the time, but we've actually collected you know, resistant material from all across the range of the Ozark chinkapin. And actually, as you get closer to the epicenter, the origin of the range where the species actually, you know, migrated out, that's where you have the highest levels of genetic diversity, and that's where you're going to see the most resistance. And what, what do we not want? What don't we want? What's not our goal? We do not want clones. We don't want to create a cultivar or a new variety. And we don't want trees to develop trees that are unfit for the environment that we plan to restore them to. So, um, and we don't want trees with little ecological utility in the native ecosystem. For example, a hybrid or, you know, another type of tree like that. We want pure trees. And if we're going to save a species, this is the only way to save the species is to, to go pure. We don't want to take a non-native species and breed it with a native species because we are then creating a new non-native species. We want pure Ozark chinkapin. So one of the coolest parts of our breeding program and something that really sets us apart and what has pushed us ahead, my dad talked about us being ahead, is this right here. And it is actually the, the role that our members and our partners play in our breeding program. So our members, when they when you join the Ozark Chinkapin Foundation and we mail you out your seed, you may just think, oh, you're getting some seed. You know, this is awesome. I paid, you know, a small membership fee. But what you are actually doing is you are participating in the research that we have been doing for 10 years. And what you're actually doing is, is you're participating in a long-term multi-site field trial. And like I said, this is what absolutely makes our program unique from any other breeding program. They've all acknowledged that, you know, this is how this should work. But bridging that gap between actually having the boots on the ground people and the funds to do this, you know, my dad, Steve Boss, he came up with this idea, a way of doing this that is just, it's absolutely brilliant. So, so um, open pollinated seed from OCF research plots are planted by our members across the Ozarks where the trees are being naturally challenged by the blight in, their, in, in a variety of environments. So we have to take this evaluation of resistance outside of the four walls of the lab, and we need to put it out into the environment because a phenotype of a tree is actually its genotype plus its environment. So when you take a tree that might seem resistant out of its environment, it could not really perform as well as you initially thought. But if you take that resistant parent tree and you breed it with another tree and you send those seed out to members, we can actually evaluate and track how well that those siblings, half sibling families or full sibling families do. And we actually track all of this. We have it in a database that tracks the pedigree of all the seed that we send out. And it's incredible. I love getting emails from people who have trees and that are already fruiting, flowering. You know, it's just awesome to see. And um, this is really some powerful stuff that we have because we've got members that have had, you know, that have had 
our trees on their property for a very long time. So we're really able to see how the trees react in an environment where they're naturally challenged by the blight, where the blight already exists in the local environment there. So Chris, Wyatt, and um, a few of the other people were talking about the Lucky Hollow test plot. And that is absolutely so awesome. And one of my favorite things about uh, what we're doing right now is this test plot. And I apologize in advance because I hope that I can articulate this to you in a way that makes sense. I may not be able to do that. So please forgive me. I made some little graphics that are not that great, but um, hopefully I can kind of help you guys understand what we're doing. So basically with every breeding program, there are three components. You have research, breeding, and then restoration. So you have the actual reforestation and that's the final phase. So we have really focused on breeding um, and that's been kind of the key to our success is we've really focused on the research and the breeding, in particular the breeding. And the final phase is actually restoration. And a lot of people ask us like, well, what does that look like? What does that mean? And I want people to understand that our goal is not to, as I said before, make some cultivar or some magic bullet of a resistant tree. We need, we are making, creating and developing populations of Ozark chinkapin that are enriched for resistance. So you're gonna have about 70 to 80% um, resistance. And here's the thing, we have to accept that some of the trees that we send out, they're not gonna have total resistance. And that's okay because the more narrowly you select for a trait like resistance, the more likely you are to lose some of those rare alleles that we need to keep in order to have that resistance. So back to the final phase. So our goal, what restoration on a full scale looks like is this. It's not that we go in and just plant a ton of Ozark chinkapin in the forest, that would be ridiculous. Our goal is to actually start in historic areas with, a, with large chinkapin population, okay? So you talk about a place like Lucky Hollow where, you know, there are fruiting chinkapin in the perimeter. So our goal is to start with those areas and work with those genetics that are present in those areas. So like I said, please forgive me for some of these slides because they're not the best, but hopefully this will kind of help you understand what that final restoration phase looks like. What does that reforestation phase look like? So we will actually initiate what I'm terming restoration hubs and locations where there are, like I said, naturally resistant pure Ozark chinkapin present there in, in the forest. And down below, I made up this little graphic for you and you can see that the little red, um, the red tree is, we'll call it, it looks like a pin, but the red pin is, represents an Ozark chinkapin with some resistance. So it's producing flowers and nuts. And the Ozark chinkapin pin with the little glow around it, that represents a blight resistant Ozark chinkapin that's mature and producing flowers and nuts, okay? So the blue pins are other tree species that are in the forest. So what we would do is we would take pollen from the most resistant trees in that area. We would bring that pollen or nuts offsite, preferably pollen, and I'll explain that later, offsite to our, our re, one of our research plots. We have like 18 research plots in three different states to do manual pollinations with other resistant trees on our test plots. Controlled pollinations will yield seed with local genetics from this particular population and genetics from resistant trees in the next closest geographical area. That way there's an increase in the genetic diversity, but also an increase in the gain for resistance, that quantitative buildup of, of resistance, okay? So basically some people term this like a, um, like a seed zone orchard or a breeding zone orchard. So we're not just slap, we don't wanna just slap some, you know, it's great that we have resistant trees, but we wanna actually consider that there are different elevations, there are different microclimates, there are different things that we need to consider before we just plant a bunch of seedlings out there. So a bunch of seeds. So what we're doing is we're actually 
going to work it this way. So the next picture, so our goal, and this also sets us apart, is that we actually think so long range. My dad and I, we have so many late night phone conversations about this, but we talk about how like what we're doing or what you guys are doing and getting to participate in is so important. And because we we care so much because we don't care about a short-term project. We know that we have to be in this for the long haul. And these trees have to be resistant forever. They The resistance has to be durable. And the great thing about what we're doing is that when we're finding these resistant trees, we don't even fully understand, we don't understand the mechanism of resistance. We're not really too concerned about the mechanism of resistance because it really to us does not matter. What matters is that the tree is resistant. And here's the great part about that. That tree that's survived and endured also has other traits that are making that tree able to survive in this environment where we have so many different pests and pathogens and different biotic and abiotic stresses that are coming at the trees. We need trees that are able to hold up against that. And so some of our trees, they like one of our trees that's really prolific it's very like it fruits a lot it produces a ton of fruit it grows really fast it's not necessarily our most blight resistant tree but it's great to have that tree in our breeding program because we cross it with other trees and we're getting um, a mix we're mixing those great genetics um, together so the way that we want to do restoration is that we want to be able to have it we want to capture natural recruitment and regeneration on its own. Yes, we'll have to do, you know, some silviculture like I show in this in this photo here. Um, but, and we'll have to, you know, um, do research and, and track everything. But our goal is that we will be able to go into those areas, remove some of the overstory trees through silviculture, take out some of those species that are suppressing the seedlings because what will happen, I see this out on, in the woods all the time, is you will see a little seedling and you might think, oh, that's a little tiny seedling. That seedling might be eight years old or 10, you know, it, it's suppressed by the, by the canopy. So um, when all the trees, you know, died, you know, oaks and other species took their place and we would need to do a little bit of light silviculture in those areas, remove some of those species to send up those um, those seedlings. So we would also need to do that in this case um, for when we're planting uh, resistant seedlings in those areas. So we would go back into those areas where we where we we took um, plant material off site, we crossed them with other resistant trees, and we would actually bring those those genetics back into that same forest. Okay, we would remove some of the overstory trees, seed from resistant Ozark chinkapin, developed at our research plots will be planted in close proximity to the resistant resisting OC in the natural stand. And then these trees will openly pollinate with each other. Okay, so in this picture, you can see that there's still a variety of, of different levels of resistance. We'll, we'll accept a tree, some trees are not totally resistant, like they have, some of the trees you'll see they're blighted, but they're still flowering and producing nuts. Hey, we'll take it. So we're, we don't want to remove those, but you know there there are times when you, if you have enough resistant tree, trees in an area, or you have a population that's resistant, um, you would want to actually um, remove some of the blighted trees that are producing flowers because you wouldn't want them to be in a close enough proximity that they're actually. Um, you know, pollinating with the other trees because we want to ensure that the next generation is, you know, those um, superior genetics. So finally, um, in this next slide, you can see over time what happens in this scenario. So over time, some of the trees will die, but some of them will remain and they will spread resistant genetics. The woodland will naturally regenerate and through natural selection, the trees with the best resistance will survive. And we're just taking cues from what happens in nature naturally on its own. But something that I think dad mentioned earlier in his presentation is that because of land use and disease, the continuous range of the Ozark chinkapin has become fragmented. So even though resistance 
is available and resistant trees exist, those trees may not be in close enough proximity to one another to openly pollinate and produce the next generation of resistant chinkapin. So that's why our intervention is so important. And that's why um, we have to do something and we are. And so I thought it was funny that somebody mentioned this. I actually put this slide in here <laughs> during the break because somebody mentioned something about um, the birds loving um, chinkapin. And what's awesome is that we have to realize like we, the reason why we don't wanna create hybrids or, or do anything that may be, you know, not ecologically sound as, as far as our approach with how we're approaching this restoration is that we need the help of the animals that, that are in the environment that depend on these trees. You know, there are, there's, I read a study about um, how squirrels cache hybrid chestnuts versus native chestnuts, and they don't cache them the same way. They don't move the material, the nuts around the same way. And trust me, those squirrels plant a lot of trees. So what's awesome is that we can expect that, you know, blue jays are huge. I don't know if you guys have ever seen blue jays, but they love Ozark chinkapin. And blue jays will actually help outcross pollen and maintain genetic diversity and actually facilitate the spread of resistance in natural stands. So it's awesome because, you know, we want, um, we want to be able to have intervention, you know, um, it was through our <laughs> meddling and things that we got ourselves, you know, in this in the first place. So it's nice for us to step in and do something, but we also need to stand back and, um, and realize that nature does, you know, help us out as well. And that's, that is a picture of a bee on an Ozark chickapin flower. So, um, all right, so we've got all these trees that we selected for resistance, but we need a way of evaluating the resistance of those trees. So there's a couple of ways that we're doing that. The main way obviously is our, is our long-term field trials, but another really important way that we evaluate the resistance of our trees is through something called a detached leaf assay, which is a, a method that we use to screen our trees for resistance. It's an artificial inoculation. Basically, we detach leaves from a tree. And even though blight is not a leaf disease, um, the results from leaf assays correlate really well with like whole stem inoculations where the whole tree is inoculated. So basically we take a little piece of chestnut blight and we put it on a leaf that we made a scratch on or a cut on. And what happens is after a period of incubation, a, an area like a lesion develops on the leaf and we can actually measure that. And it gives us an idea about the overall resistance of the tree, like relatively to, to the rest of them. So, um, in the spring of 2019, I did a series of leaf assays to screen some of our trees for blight resistance to see how resistant that they are. So thankfully, um, through our board member, Matthew Albrick, who works at the Missouri Botanical Gardens here in St. Louis, Missouri, where I live, um, we were able to use, I was able to use their genetics lab that they have there to do, um, to do this research. And it's really important because they actually have to maintain an organism in order to carry out these experiments. It's a lot of work and they also let me use their greenhouse, which is awesome. So let me show you how I, this is showing the isolation of the blight, but I'm gonna break this down for you how I did that. So it starts with this right here. And I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but um, this first picture is a picture of an Ozark chinkapin um, that has an active canker. And I hope that you guys can see this, but if you look, you can see the difference between the healthy bark and the infected tissue. So you can see that tan mycelial mat underneath the bark and it's, um, you can also see some orange marks on the um, surface, which is the, the fruiting body of the chestnut blight. So in the spring, um, when, you, when the cankers are active like this, um, what we do is we take a bark sample from the leading edge of that canker. So we kind of want to include some of the healthy tissue because if we take a sample from the middle, there's a lot of other like organisms, dead microbes and stuff that are there. And you'll, you know, it's, it's a lot easier just to take it from the active edge of the canker. And um, you can see here that we just plate it and um, we surface sterilize it and we plate it on auger. 
agar is just like a very simple um, nutrient that that the blight needs to grow slowly on and then after it grows out we can actually isolate it and um, the blight Prythonectria parasitica is very predictable in how much that it grows. So it grows like five millimeters per day. It's a very like fast. So it's a very um, easy to identify in culture. And obviously there's other ways that we do that as well. But um, so from those, uh, after isolating the blight, uh, we transfer it to PDA, which is a different type of medium, um, potato dextrose agar and then um, we subculture it for I subcultured it four days before each experiment um, some people they just replicate the same plate they keep trans making transfers but what I found when I initially started my series of uh, test inoculations because I practiced this for a long time before I did the actual study what I found was that when you transfer it for so like from plate to plate because eventually it starts growing out of that plate and so you have to put it into a new dish, petri dish. And so what happens is that it starts to lose some of its virulence. So I noticed this. So because of that observation, I just went ahead and just freshly do a fresh isolation um, so that um, it's as virulent as possible. Okay, so now, um, so that, uh, while that's going on in the lab, um, in the spring, we actually selected 25 trees on our research plots that we wanted to screen for resistance. And so there is a certain criteria. The great thing about a detached leaf assay is that it does not matter the age of the tree. So I could test literally a seedling or I could test a full grown 50 year old tree. What is important though is the selection of the leaf. So the leaf has to be from this year's new growth, but the leaf cannot be one of the newest um, leaves. The, the leaf needs to be fully expanded. It doesn't need to have any redness on that tip of it, not too soft. So about the fourth or fifth leaf from the tree. And so from each tree that I was going to screen, I collected seven to 10 leaves. And what I did is I put those leaves into a bag and labeled the bag according to the the trees, you know, um, and then I put it in a cooler and then transported it off site to where I was going to inoculate them. And then at this time, I also collected leaves from greenhouse grown American, pure American, and pure Chinese chestnuts. And so the reason why I collected leaves from American and Chinese chestnuts is because I was. And going, I inoculated them at the same time I did all the Ozark chinkapin trees. And the reason why is that American and Chinese chestnuts have known levels of host resistance. So there's low susceptibility in Chinese chestnut and high susceptibility in American chestnut. And for that reason, I used those as controls in my experiment. So my susceptible control was American chestnut and my resistant control is Chinese chestnut. You know, over in Asia where the blight evolved with the Asian chestnut species, selective pressure conferred resistance in those species. So um, that's why it's so devastating here in America because we don't have that co-evolutionary advantage of having our trees, you know, come up with the, that species of, of blight. So um, the source that I got the seedlings from is listed below in that table. Okay, now on to the fun part, which is the leaf inoculations. So like I described earlier, a five millimeter wound is made on the backside of the leaf. About 30 millimeters above the petiole of the leaf is where I did it. And, you, and the cut has to be about mid vein on each leaf. So using a cork borer that we sterilized, I punched out uniform pieces of chestnut blight and used that as a little plug that had some fungus on it from the um, colony, the active colony, perimeter of the colony. And then what I did is I took that little piece of blight and I put it mycelial side down on top of that scratch, that little cut that I made on the leaf. So then um, after this, I put all of the leaves in a gasket sealed containers with damp paper towels and stored them um, in a dark room and they incubated for four days. 
And within 24 hours, uh, Pryphonectria parasitica begins to colonize the wound on the leaves and they develop a dark area of brown tissue, which you can see on that photo right there. All right, so after that period of time, the brown tissue that developed around the inoculation site was measured in length and width to calculate an estimated area. So the lesion area was um, calculated in two ways. I did it manually with a millimeter ruler, and then I also used a plant software called Assess 2.0, and it's actually, it's very awesome because it gives me an exact area because the area for the um, lesion is not perfectly uniform, so it's kind of an estimation a little bit, um, like when you're doing it just length and width, but the software gave me actual perfect um, number or value to use. So in the spring, I did a total of 286 individual inoculations over several experiments during that growing season, and the mean lesion area of 25 Ozark chinkapin selections Chinese chestnut and American chestnut were compared to determine relative resistance. And so in this graph, I have displayed the results and I put up here um, that the shorter bars indicate trees with the most resistance to blight. So I, I hate whenever there's like a graphic like this and, and no one explains like what's going on. So let me try to explain this to you. So basically what you see, um, when you look at this graph is each bar is representing an Ozark chingopin accession that we have, or like a genotype, a genetic line that we have, a tree essentially, or it's a, it's a cross that we've made. And if the bar is short, then that's representing the, the average necrotic area that formed on the leaf. So that means the, the, the shorter the bar, the more resistant that that tree is to the chestnut blight. Now, the yellow and the red bar. So the yellow bar is the Chinese chestnut. So we know that the Chinese chestnut is resistant to chestnut blight or has, you know, most is, has great resistance to the chestnut blight. And we know that the American chestnut is very susceptible to the chestnut blight because of low genetic um, diversity and variability and things. So when you look at this graph, this is very promising because we can actually see that we have successfully selected resistant parents. And also we've successfully produced several resistant Ozark chinkapin with host resistance that is similar to or greater than Chinese chestnut, which we know is resistant to blight. So this was awesome. Um, news, very, very good news, very exciting, um, great news. Here's a little graphic that I made showing, you can see up in the top, we have our Chinese chestnut control and American chestnut. You can see the necrotic area on the American chestnut in the top right corner is very great. And then you can see the very small area that developed on the Chinese chestnut. And then down here, I just kind of put up our most resistant trees that we had, and you can look at the um, necrotic area, and it's just, it's awesome. Um, so yeah, those are our top like six resistant trees. And I wanna thank you guys so much. And if you guys have any questions, I would love to answer them. Okay, Leslie, there was one question posted in the chat. Um, Mark Stokes asked, at what density does OCF envision planting a restoration site? Um, I guess I didn't do a very good job of explaining that with that um, graphic, but um, repeat that question one more time. He asked, at what density does the Ozark Chinkapin Foundation envision planting in a restoration site? Um, I don't know that we're looking at it in terms of density. I, without them being more specific about what that means, I don't, I don't know. But um, like I said, our goal is we want to restore smart. We don't want to just plant a bunch of trees. Like that's not what we're like doing. We want to, we want to to be very tactful and know what we're doing, which is like Lucky Hollow. Like that's a perfect example of us literally walking in our destiny and doing what we 
have dreamed about doing. Like that's, that is our vision is, is basically what we're doing there, which is setting up those re restoration hubs, like I termed it. Um, I don't really know a better word for it, but it's, it's where we're, you know, basically allowing the trees to have to naturally regenerate on their own. Yes, that involves planting, but um, we want to do more research on that. But, um, but yeah, I'm sorry, I can't answer the question better. I think I would need a little more information. Leslie, I don't know about that. Um, pollen records indicate that uh, the trees were about 2% of the landscape, so that would be pretty beneficial to just use as a yardstick, but that's uh, well off in the future for us to get anything like that. But having 1% or 2% of your forest made up of Ozark chinkapins, that would be uh, fantastic and uh, part of our wildest imagination. I agree, AJ. 100%. And, and if I can add a comment that we had last night at our board meeting, uh, we talked, and Leslie couldn't be there. She had to be at work. So we had to record our board meeting for the members who couldn't be at it. But it was discussed kind of like what Mark is asking about. And so um, the answer that we came up with was kind of a multifaceted approach. Some places like we're doing <laughs> in Arkansas, we're, we're planting like, uh, you know, we've got around 30 something trees growing. You know, the very best genetics going uh, head to head with blighted trees there. And so there's going to be a lot of genetic mixing, which is what we want. And so last night, the comment and part of the discussion was about other areas. Like, what if you have a, a ridge line, let's say, where it has never been converted and you do have some remnant populations in there? Um, and by the way, these are hard to find anymore, but let's say you do have a ridge line and you do have some remnant populations in there that are blighted, uh, closed canopy. So we talked about going into those locations and uh, selectively removing maybe, you know, two to four trees uh, from the canopy, open that canopy up. So those, um, those trees are repressed by the canopy, those remnant populations are flowering and then plant maybe four to eight Ozark chinkapins along in that area that have the high resistance. So it, instead of being a hub, it'd be more like a, um, uh, you know, like an abbreviation of that. And so we're talking about trying to do those in different, different locations. And when we actually first started planning these research test plots, um, we took locations kind of like what we talked about last night and we started there. And obviously the more genetics you can put in there, uh, the quicker you can speed up the recovery. And so hopefully, Mark, that <clears throat> answers some of your question. Um, but that's kind of what we're looking at. It's kind of a, um, a uh, mixed bag approach. Um, our members, by all means, are one part of it. Uh, you're a member too, and just you giving out the seed in Georgia to other people, uh, getting those back out makes a big, big, big difference. I actually got my first Georgia Ozark chinkapins uh, from a remnant population this uh, last year. But hopefully that kind of answers your question. I want to just say something. Hi, Leslie. Hi, everybody. I Hi. haven't been, I've had a lot of things going on, so I haven't been able to be part of all the meetings. But Leslie, we've been watching and knowing you ever since you first were you're quite young when we first started all this. I am just, I, I'm just so impressed that you are such a scientist and you're so eloquent in your speaking and, and I just, kudos to you. I'm so impressed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. <laughs> you're the best. You're the best. Well, on the, uh, on the actual program itself, thank you, Leslie. I like your example with the pins and did um, did a super good job. I like the pens laying down. That helped explain it, which um, making people understand what, what we're really trying to do and how it would take place. You have to have a vision of what you're going to do, and then you got to be able to make that understandable to others. You did a real good job with it. One other takeaway I had from all this is that, um, you know, you talked about the Blue Jay. And so, um, and I, I hate that I accidentally deleted it, but I had an excellent video of a blue jay that landed in an Ozark Chinkapin research test spot. And, and it was a real drab day, kind of gray. And that blue jay landed there, brilliant colors. And it picked up chinkapin after chinkapin after chinkapin. And I did not realize 
that like a crow, they had a crop as well. And so if we were trying to uh, do something where we're making real huge nuts that Blue Jay had not evolved with, uh, he wouldn't be able to carry them off. And so, uh, and it's like with our native pollinators, um, you know, everybody talks about the honeybees, but they're not native. Um, our native pollinators are the unsung heroes and flowers have evolved uh, for them to actually fit into them. And so going back to what you were just saying about coexisting, um, for you know, millennia, these uh, native insects and birds and animals have uh, coexisted with the Ozark chinkapin and the American chestnut. And so restoring this back uh, restores a vital component of our ecosystem. And uh, so, you know, uh, so that's why we, we didn't go with hybridization. And a lot of us uh, that actually work in resource management in state and federal agencies west of the Mississippi River, uh, they wouldn't let us if we wanted to restore anything that was wrong, would not let us do that. Um, that's a great that's, point, Dad. Yeah. That's a really good point. So, so that was one of my takeaways from it. So we continue to lose by degrees our native insects. You lose your native plants, then you begin to lose your native insects. And uh, then when you lose that, you start losing your, um, you know, your birds and other animals as well, too. And A.J. Hendershot summed it up really good years ago when he said, you know, um, our environment, if you think of it like an orchestra, you know, uh, we keep losing musical instruments, if you will, like plants, and then along with them, the species that depend on these plants. You still hear the music, but it's not as rich and it's not as vibrant as it once was when you begin to lose a violin here or a flute. You, know, you can still hear the music, but it's not the same. So my takeaway of what you said, um, um, you know, with uh, like coexisting and restoring something that once was there and not changing it, we're, you know, doing that. And it's happening right now as we speak. This is not a pipe dream. And, uh, you know, if, if these trees that we're planting now, um, if our indications so far are correct, you know, no blight on them. Uh, you know, they've been dealing with the blight, but no blight. Uh, they're not dying from blight. If they die from anything, it's maybe extreme drought, um, you know, or, or it could be, um, you know, eaten up uh, in a young stage by a deer because they weren't protected. So, but that's what happens um, anyhow. And uh, so thank you very much for what you're doing, Leslie. I'm really, really proud of you. And I uh, can't say enough good things. Proud so. of you, too. Yeah.